So you may have heard of an event that was planned for this January in Ireland. It was announced just yesterday that it is not going to go ahead. And this was because of the controversy that it stirred up with uh, strong feelings on both sides. Although I think the majority of people did not want it to go ahead. And this was a commemoration of the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, which includes, or included for a short period of time, from 1920 to 1922, a group called the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. So let's go back to just get a quick background to get some context on the Black and Tans. So let's go back to the beginning of the last century, just to get a very, very kind of quick background to get an idea of why people why this thing is so controversial at the moment so in the early 1900s in ireland there was the issue of home rule that was in the forefront of many people's minds with uh, irish nationalists pursuing home rule from the united kingdom when ireland was still under uk rule but then, of course, when the First World War broke out in 1914, it was kind of put on the back burner. Then in 1916, as you probably know, the Easter Rising was held. And after this, there was growing support among the Irish people for independence in Ireland. A couple of points that happened around this time... Sinn Féin party won a majority of Irish seats in the 1918 general election and then in 1919 they founded an independent Irish parliament which is called Dáil Éireann and it's still called Dáil, the Dáil, Dáil Éireann and then they declared an independent Irish republic. The Dáil asked the people to boycott the RIC which is the Royal Irish Constabulary and then the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, began attacking police barracks and ambushing police patrols. Later in the year, the doll was outlawed by the British Prime Minister at the time, David Lloyd George, and the British Army, British Army presence in Ireland was increased. After the end of the First World War, there were many unemployed ex-soldiers who had fought in the war. And it was suggested that these people could be recruited into the RIC in Ireland. However, the Inspector General of the RIC, Joseph Byrne, was against the idea. Going back to the history of the RIC, it used to be called the Irish Constabulary from 1836 to 1867. And then it became the Royal Irish Constabulary. And it was the police force in Ireland until 1922. However, Joseph Byrne was then replaced by T.J. Smith, who was in favour of recruiting the ex-soldiers into the RIC, and he issued an order authorising the recruitment in Britain. Very quickly, ads turned up in major cities looking for men who were willing to face a rough and dangerous task. And then, in less than a week, the first British recruits joined the RIC on the 2nd of January 1920. And the total amount who were recruited was 10,000 during this whole uh, period from January 1920 until the end. There were so many new recruits that there was a shortage of RIC uniforms, so the newer people got khaki army uniforms and dark green RIC tunics, caps and belts. So because of the colours of the clothes they were wearing, they got their nickname Black and Tans. And as I said before, most of them were, they had been in the First World War. They joined the Black and Tans or the RIC for money because apparently it offered good wages and the prospect of a pension. They weren't very well trained though. They only trained for a couple of weeks or months being, before being sent out to their posts. And then as well as the Black and Tans, there was also another division, a new auxiliary division. And these were an offensive paramilitary force composed of ex-British military and naval officers, dressed in distinctive uniforms and organised in military-style companies. 
Although a lot of people use the term black and tans to refer to both the black and tans and the auxiliaries. And the problem with these people were the way they treated the civilians in Ireland. Apparently some Irish constables got on well with their British colleagues who were working in the black and tans, but it, apparently many did not like them, as they saw them as rough. Not, not much time had gone by before they started gaining a reputation for brutality. So whenever they were attacked by the IRA, they would take revenge against the Irish civilian population. For example, in the summer of 1920, the Black and Tans burned and sacked many small towns and villages in Ireland, beginning with Toome and County Galway, and including Trim, Balbriggan, Knock Crochery, Thurlis, Temple Moor, and many other small towns. They even besieged Tralee in Kerry, after the IRA abducted and killed two local RIC men. All the businesses were closed for the week, they didn't let, let any food get in, and they killed three local civilians. Then in November, they abducted, or they were suspected of abducting and murdering a priest in Galway, Father Michael Griffin. The turnover was quite quick in the black and tans, more than one third of them actually left the service before they were all finally disbanded in 1922. During this whole period, 500 members of the RIC died in the conflict and over 600 were injured. And I'll go into more details about some of the atrocities they committed in another article, but first of all, let's take a look at an article about the commemoration. So let's take a look at an article in The Independent. Boycotts and blame Black and Tan's event descends into farce. Plans for a controversial commemoration of the Royal Irish Constabulary are in tatters after the government was humiliated into can cancelling next week's gathering. Despite denying it amounted to a celebration of the infamous Black and Tans, Justice Minister Charlie Flanagan capitulated to calls for the commemoration to be called off. His decision came within hours of Tishok Leo Varadkar and other senior ministers stridently defending the plans. We'll skip down a bit in the article because it's quite long. Apparently this was discussed at a meeting last April. The minutes from the meeting record that a number of specific themes were considered, including appropriately acknowledging the role of the Royal Irish Constabulary and Dublin Metropolitan Police. No dissent by attendees is recorded in the minutes of the meeting, and the former culture minister Heather Humphreys was one of the people who was defending the plans. She said there were many Irish men among the ranks of the RIC and DNP who made the ultimate sacrifice. She added they gave up their lives and it's important that we remember them, and insisted we should not be conflating this with the black and tans and the auxiliaries, that's wrong. As the controversy grew yesterday, the Taoiseach who the Taoiseach also mounted a defense of the commemoration, insisting it's about remembering our history, not condoning what happened. He added we should be mature enough as a state to acknowledge all aspects of our past. However, independent ministers Kevin Boxer, Moran, Finian McGrath and Sean Canney all later came out and said they would not attend, as did Fine Gael TD's Noel Rock and Fergus O'Dowd. Gonna go to another article, actually from back in 2006, but it just has some more information on some of the acts carried out by this group. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it's about Ben and Jerry's um, ice cream flavor called the Black and Tans, and people getting angry about that. Skipping down to the more historical part. Although the Black and Tans force was deployed for only a couple of years from 1920 to 1922, nationalist Ireland still associates it with murder, brutality, massacre and indiscipline in the years leading to Southern Ireland's independence. In this instance, its reputation is not based on any Republican propaganda and exaggeration since there is no dispute that the Tans killed and destroyed on a large scale, nor did they, nor did they make any secret of their ferocious reprisals. When a tan was killed in Cork, they burnt down more than 300 buildings in the city centre and afterwards proudly pinned pieces of burnt cork to their caps. 
A British Labour Party commission reported that it felt feelings of shame at witnessing the insolent swagger of the tans, whom they described as rough, brutal, abusive, and distinctly the worse for liquor. Another observer reported, They had neither religion nor morals. They used foul language. They had the old soldier's talent for dodging and scrounging, called the Irish natives, associated with low company, stole from each other, sneered at the customs of the country, and drank to excess. The Catholic cardinal of the day called them a horde of savages, some of them brigands, burglars, and thieves. Similar denunciations came from within the armed forces. Their commander, General Frank Crozier, resigned in 1921 because they had been used to murder, rob, loot, and burn up the innocent because they could not catch the few guilty on the run. The Black and Tans were created after the First World War by Winston Churchill and other ministers who were faced with an increasing tide of violence from the IRA, which had launched a campaign to drive Britain out of Ireland. This is known as the War of Independence, though Republicans took to calling it the Tan War, with the IRA inflicting heavy casualties on the Royal Irish Constabulary, killing more than 50 of its officers, London created new forces to cope with the Republican insurrection. They were part of a hurriedly constructed counterinsurgency apparatus, which included the existing police force, the regular army, secret service detachments and two completely new forces, the auxiliaries and the black and tans. In the years that followed, all these groups were deployed against Republican rebels, but the particularly violent behaviour of the Tans, together with their striking nickname, has meant that the blame for most of the behaviour has stuck to them. The nickname arose entirely accidentally. The recruits, many hardened by trench warfare, were given only a few months training before being dispatched to Ireland, supposedly to act as policemen, but in fact to provide military steel. In Ireland, they faced a very different type of war. The IRA waged guerrilla warfare with hit-and-run tactics, attacks on isolated police barracks and deadly ambushes in territory which was unfamiliar to the Tans. All the security forces found this an extremely frustrating type of conflict, but the Tans in particular quickly abandoned the normal rules and conduct of war. They were in any case explicitly instructed to step outside the law, one police divisional commander instructing his men in a speech, if a police barracks is burnt, then the best house in the locality is to be commandeered, the occupants thrown into the gutter. Let them die there, the more the merrier. He instructed them to shout hands up at civilians and to shoot anyone who did not immediately obey. He added, innocent persons may be shot, but that cannot be helped. And you are bound to get the right parties sometime. The more you shoot, the better I will like you, and I assure you no policeman will get in trouble for shooting any man. The old-style policemen did not care for the tans. One saying years later, the black and tans were all English and Scotch people, very rough, effing and blinding and boozing and all. A British army officer complained to a general, we are importing crowds of undisciplined men who are just terrorising the country. Not all of the almost 10,000 tans scattered around Ireland were guilty of atrocities. Some were actually liked. But many felt free, as individuals or as units, to go far beyond the substantial degree of licence they had been officially granted. Tans were reportedly among those who took part in Bloody Sunday, an incident which followed the assassination of a large number of suspected members of the British Secret Service in Dublin. Hours after these killings, security forces opened fire at a Gaelic football match in the city, causing twelve deaths and wounding scores. In other cases, homes and businesses, particularly creameries, were burnt by the towns. In the town of Balbriggan, near Dublin, the IRA killing of a police officer led to severe reprisals. The two, two Republican suspects were shot dead, and 19 houses and various buildings were torched. There were hundreds of reports of misbehaviour on a smaller scale. The late Lord Longford wrote of towns torturing captured Republicans, cutting out the tongue of one, the nose of another, the heart of another, and battering in the skull of a fourth. The government at first turned a blind eye to such incidents. Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson described a conversation with Churchill. I warned him again that those black and tans, who are committing very indiscriminate reprisals, will play the devil in Ireland, but he won't listen or agree. 
the security forces, the field marshal said, marked down certain Sinn Feiners as, in their opinion, actual murderers or instigators, and then coolly went and shot them, without question or trial. Winston saw very little harm in this, but it horrifies me. Pressure on the government to end the activities mounted steadily. The Archbishop of Canterbury, warning Lloyd George, You do not cast out Beelzebub by Beelzebub. Churchill's wife Clementine joined in the chorus of protest, asking him to end the reprisals and adding, It always makes me unhappy and disappointed when I see you inclined to take for granted the rough, iron-fisted, hunnish way will prevail. Later, Churchill openly acknowledged the excesses of the black and tans. Admitting at the House of Commons, it was quite impossible to prevent the police and military making reprisals on their own account. Ministers pondered on whether they should officially endorse reprisals and persisted in believing that the oppressive tactics of the tans and other forces were on the point of delivering victory. Lloyd George famously boasted that he had murder by the throat. But on top of everything, the harsh methods of the Tans did not even work, and certainly did not defeat the IRA. Professor Roy Foster wrote of the Tans, They behaved more like independent mercenaries. Their brutal regime followed the IRA's policy of killing policemen, and was taken by many to vindicate it. The historian, Peter Hart, agreed, it was astoundingly counterproductive. The militarized police formed their own death squads and regularly engaged in reprisals against civilians. IRA violence only increased. Despite the battering which all this inflicted on the image of Britain at home and abroad, the continuing IRA campaign eventually led Lloyd George to seek talks with the Republicans, which led to British withdrawal. In a little-known historical footnote, some of the black and tans were transferred to Palestine, where, under much stricter discipline, their performance was judged a success. But in Ireland, older folk still relate with a shiver what the tans did in their little village or town, the name and reputation of the force continuing to resound throughout history. And, auxiliaries. and as you saw in the article, some of the people who wanted it to go ahead were saying that it's not a celebration, it's just remembering what happened. So, I think the people who lost their lives should be remembered, and we mustn't forget the things that happened. But of course, if it's any kind of celebration of this, then I think it's totally inappropriate. So, tell me what you think in the comments. Do you, how do you think the event would have gone were it to go ahead, and would you have supported it? And I'll talk to you soon.